Ephesians chapter 6. I know you have your your special to play, um, and let's close the service with that. Um, But Ephesians chapter 6. Now, where the Lord takes us, I don't know, but we'll see, we'll see what he has in mind for us tonight. Whatever you have heard so far tonight, God knew before the foundation of the world that you would be here tonight to hear that testimony. And so whatever the Lord is laying on your heart tonight, do. Uh, I wasn't planning on doing this, but we'll have the love offering box And anything, brother, anything that we get tonight, if you can somehow get it specifically to your preachers, um, in any, the best way, use your discretion on how it would best be handled. Uh, But the love offering box will be for uh, the preachers in Myanmar tonight. Um, So whatever the Lord moves you to, um, but most of all, pray. Uh, This is where... Uh, you all know I hate talking politics. I hate talking politics. Uh, I would just as soon cut myself with paper and then rub lemon juice in it. Um, but this is where prayer is needed in our country. Yes. Um, just, just earlier this week, I saw uh, something on Twitter a, a, a gentleman had put on, and I use that term loosely, um, but he was, he was a, a, a transgender activist. Um, he was one of those in, in Romans that uh, he wasn't taking part in it, but he has pleasure in those that do, Romans chapter 1. And he said specifically that he was speaking out against the term biological male because it was discriminatory against transgenders. And this is where it begins. Uh, You know my heart and how for a few years now, as the Lord led, I would would mention that things were getting harder um, and, and it was going to get darker and darker. Uh, Just a little while ago, I preached uh, about the Equality Act and how I don't have hope for America. And I, I, I say that with this caveat, that I do have hope for the American people. The people that live in this country, I have hope for them. But I don't know about the country of America. I don't know. We as a whole have turned our backs on God. The heart of the people has waxed gross. There was one person that said, what's the difference between darkness and gross darkness? Gross darkness is 144 times darker than regular darkness. And that's where we're at. Um, the things that you heard tonight as moving and as stirring as they were, we haven't seen that. You haven't experienced that in your own eyes, with your own eyes. You haven't heard it with your own ears. You haven't felt it. Um, But my duty as the under-shepherd is to prepare the flock for whatever may come. And it seems like in our lifetime, we may see that here. And so tonight, in the remaining time that we have, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6 for some perspective. Verse 10, he starts out. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, 
against spiritual wickedness in high places. There was a time when those words meant very little to us. We understood the spiritual application, but we did not see how that applied to us. But we're seeing it more and more and more. We're seeing good being called evil and evil being called good and God pronounced woe on those that would. And as we view things in our country degressing at the rate that they are, it's exponential. Just as an earthquake is exponentially worse and worse and worse as it gains in magnitude, so our country is slipping into demise. And the one reason is, is because we've turned our back on God. Christians have become comfortable. During the moral majority, we enjoyed a great boom in church growth. And we've been riding on that slope ever since. And if you are driving a car uphill and you put it in neutral, you will eventually stop and roll backwards. And that's what we're seeing. It's been said that any failures that we have in our lives are only because of prayer failures. We pray for revival in this country. We pray for revival in our town, in the Oswego Valley. But revival never comes without prayer. You cannot expect revival in a nation or in a people or in a church with only a once-a-week prayer meeting that's attended by 20% of the congregation. I mentioned last Wednesday night that the Wednesday night prayer meeting is the most important service of the week. And then I challenged how you thought on that and said, let's cancel Sunday services and only have Wednesday night. And I love you all, but it was quiet. How badly do you love your church? How badly do you love your country? Where is your heart in relation to the Lord? Because we've been given a stark reminder tonight that these days are getting evil. The only way you prepare for a battle is to get strong ahead of time. And we are heading into a spiritual battle that, friends, we are not ready for. We are not prepared. We are the United States on December 6, 1941 asleep. We need to be prepared for this thing that's coming. I don't want to proclaim doom and gloom. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a warmonger. But my Jesus said, watch and pray. We're charged here to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. For far too long, we've been strong in the flesh. We can make a fair show in the flesh with the externalism of fundamentalism. We know how to dress right. We know when to say amen. We know how to sing right. We know how to make sure everybody knows in here that we're spiritual. But what about Tuesday night at your home? What about Thursday morning at your workplace? Is there a difference? Why? The Lord must be working in you in order for him to work through you. If you aren't yielding to the leading of the Holy Ghost in your life, in sanctification, he will not use you he will set you aside. He'll give you over to yourself. And you will be ineffective. I have written on a plaque in my office up next door. 
It's a quote from D.L. Moody. And if Satan is not hindering your work, it is because your work is of no consequence. We see that played out in the testimony that we've heard over in Myanmar. Many, many, many Buddhists having the light shown to them for the first time. The gospel coming, shining a light. It's an interesting thing about light is that there is no darkness dark enough to stop light because light in its very nature dispels darkness. Jesus Christ is that true light. John chapter 1. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. But if we walk in darkness, he that hateth his brother is in darkness even until now, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because he walketh in darkness. The darkness in our lives that we allow in, and we allow it in. Yes, you, if you argue with that point, you're telling me that the God of all creation is weak enough to allow darkness into your life for you to stumble into sin. If there's darkness in your life, you have yielded to it. God tempts no man with darkness. That is only from Satan, the father of all lies. The perspective that we have tonight is fresh and new. This is not at all what I had planned for tonight. We were going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But whatever it is that you receive out of this, you will have to answer for at the judgment. When you stand before Christ, the word that you have heard today and the testimony tonight, you will answer for. If you're lost tonight, you'll stand before Christ, the King, And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, but God, I... No. Oh, but I was... No. But look at how well I dressed. No. But look, I stopped swearing. No. The blood was never applied. Up until the 1900s, there was no preaching on the rapture. The preaching was all about standing before Christ in judgment. What changed? Did the judgment seat change? No. We talk about that Bema seat as the place where we will receive our rewards, and we will be rewarded, but not every reward is good. Every idle word that you have ever spoken or thought in your heart will be played out. It will be judged. Those things that you said about your sister over there, those things that you said about your brother over here, they will be played out for everyone to hear. Every idle word spoken will be judged. Everything that you have heard, every bit of word that has been preached to you, You will have to give an account for, what did you do with it? Paul tells us that we will be judged for the things done in our body, whether they be good or bad. My sin nature was judged on the cross, but I'm responsible for how I live for God and how I yield to him or how I yield to the flesh. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
We watched a video this afternoon describing the immensity of the universe. It had a soccer ball, a size five soccer ball, standard size soccer ball, football for our European friends. And they, they had painted it yellow and they, they wanted to just give a real life scale as to the size of our solar system. They had a pinhead at, what was it, 75 yards away and that represented the distance between the sun and the earth. And then it was maybe a mile and a half away was the farthest planet. And apparently they found this new super planet way out there. And it was the size of a pinhead, but it was 17 and a half miles away with that pinhead being the size of the planet and the soccer ball being the size of the sun. 17 and a half miles, that's like from here to the middle of Olean, the first roundabout, okay? That's just our little bitty solar system. They say that the farthest galaxy that the most powerful telescopes have discovered is 14 billion light years away. And if we're somewhere in the middle of the universe, that means there's another 14 billion light years the other way. And what that basically means is if you were to travel the speed of light for 14 billion years, that's, you would finally reach that galaxy. And there's more than likely immensity beyond that. And all of that creation is summed up in, and he made the stars also. So who are you strong in? We don't know how we will react in a situation like that. We don't know how we will respond. But I know the God of all grace. And I know the promises in his word. And I know that if I'm commanded to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, he'll give me the strength. He is the mightiest thing in this universe. The powers of darkness cannot stomp it out because of the very nature of light. And God is light. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, there is a command even in that not to sit idly by against the wiles of the devil. It starts in your mind. This is where the battle is, right here. Amen. The battle is right here. There are many ways that Satan can work his ways in you. There was a time when I was told that, oh, just, just don't utter anything. Don't, don't say the thing because Satan can't read your thoughts. Really? Then why does God tell us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind? That's where he's waging the war, because if he can get you thinking wrong, he will get the desires of your heart driven in a carnal way, and you will live carnally, destroying your testimony, destroying any good that you could possibly do for the Lord Jesus Christ. Destroying a church, destroying a town, destroying a state, destroying a nation, and it starts in your mind. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The very first thing that he came to Eve with was, Hath God said? Questioning God's word. And today, from pulpits, I guarantee you, in at least 100,000 pulpits across this nation today, this book was questioned as to whether or not you can actually believe it. Well, this original Greek manuscript said this, and this one over here said that, and this version says this, and this one says that, and if we take this and this and this and this and this and put it all together, we'll get somewhat of a foggy idea of what God said. God said you can know!
My wife told the ladies this morning, and, and for you men, you weren't in the ladies' class, but gave an example of how Satan has hidden God's perfected word in plain sight. A man was walking through the woods. I'll probably have it a little different than what she had it. A man was walking through the woods, and he came across a leprechaun. And the leprechaun had a whole huge pot of gold, but he had it hidden in the woods. And he said, if you catch me, I'll, I'll show you where my gold is hidden. Okay? And so the man chased after the leprechaun, finally caught up to him, held right on to him and said, you, you promised you'd, sh you'd show me where your gold is and I could have that gold. And he says, yep, sure enough. So he, he said, set me down and I'll take you right to it. And he, sure enough, he did. He walked right up to a tree and underneath the tree was buried his pot of gold. But the guy didn't have a shovel. How is he going to get it? So he says, I'm going to go get a shovel and I'm going to tie a yellow ribbon around this tree. You have to promise me you won't touch that ribbon. He says, I promise. The leprechaun says, I promise I will not touch the ribbon. I will not take your ribbon off of that tree. So the man runs back to his home, goes back, gets a shovel, runs back, and as soon as he gets to the forest, he sees the leprechaun had tied a yellow ribbon on every tree in the forest. Hidden in plain sight. Isn't it interesting that to Islam, to even translate the Quran out of Islam, out of the, the native tongue, what's the word for it? Help me. Arabic, thank you. To translate it out of Arabic is considered blasphemous. And yet we have thousands of translations of the Bible, only one Quran. Do you think that's on accident? That's by design. These are the wiles of the devil. And what he has done is he has blinded the eyes of them that are lost, lest the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ should shine unto them and they be converted. And so where does that leave us? Learn this book while it's still legal to have. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. There is an evil day coming. Whatever that evil is, God has given you everything you need to stand in it. He did not say he would stop the evil day from coming. He didn't say he would make the evil day easy for you. He just said, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And quite often this passage is ended here. But we're going to go back to the first thing that we talked about now. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We're happy to put on the whole armor of God for us, but even in that, Satan, in his subtlety, comes to us and says, you better look out for yourself and prepare yourself for battle, Oh, by the way, forget about the rest of your church family. Forget about your preacher. Forget about the preachers down the road. Forget about the Christians overseas that are being murdered. Forget about the people in Myanmar. Let's just keep your focus here so you don't see everything else that's going on around you. Watch, therefore. Watch, therefore. 
when Jesus, let's, let's turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 22. Verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and had seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See that thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. He saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. There were times when John was told, don't mention this until. When he saw the transfiguration of Jesus, he was not to talk about that until he was received up into glory. And then he recorded it in his gospel. But here, he is told, don't seal it up, for the time is at hand. Time is short. And this is 2,000 years ago. Two days on God's calendar. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Did we not just hear about that? That judgment seat. Judgment is coming. Your Bible says judgment must first come to the house of God. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. In verse 20, He which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And I say, Even so, come Lord Jesus. And I love, I love John's closing statement here. This is his personal goodbye. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. There's coming a day when we're going to need his grace. Many of our brothers and sisters have gone before us, and they've been put to the stake. They've put up against the wall. They've had the rope put around their neck the blade put to their neck. And we say and we wonder, well, what will I do? If you're a born-again believer, he giveth more grace. Thank God. Thank God. Even so, come Lord Jesus.